I'm very proud of the housing that, we, that we've done during my time for, the, you know, for those, for the people who really stood in need of housing. Knight of St. Andrew and former Deputy Prime Minister and Member of Parliament for St. Michael North, Sir Philip Marlowe Grays, the focus of this edition of We Bajans. Philip Marlowe Graves was born in 1931 to Alma and Edgar Graves. The second of nine children, he grew up in Northumberland, St. Lucie. He received his early education at St. Clement's Primary, now the Ignatius Byer School, and later went on to the Parry School, now Coleridge and Parry, for his secondary education from 1941 to 1943 before moving on to Harrison College from 1943 to 1950. He studied classics from 1950 to 1953, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree. He went to England where he acquired his Council of Legal Education certificate and was admitted to the bar in 1963, later becoming a Queen's Council in 1986. He later took up a teaching post in St. Vincent at the Grammar School William Loci for six years. On his return to Barbados, he also wrote a political column for the Daily News. His marriage to Jeanette Simmons produced three daughters, Lisa and twin daughters Gina and Brita. It was while he was studying in England that at the urging of Richie Haynes, he joined the Democratic Labour Party. But what were the other factors that led to the decision to enter the political arena? I had a grandfather who was a vestryman. In those days, they had something called the vestry, which was succeeded by local government. Okay? And he, way back, um, long before he was born, was a vestryman. But when he was born and growing up, he was still a vestryman. And it, it is a form of politics for, the, for St. Lucy, where, 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 where I am, I've come from. And um, so I took an interest in that. I took an interest in the general elections, with Mr. Branker and Mr. Lyle Ward, later to he, later succeeded by Cameron Tudor, okay. And, um, I, but I, I have all this, almost throughout my life, virtually throughout my life, taken an interest in politics. Not only in Barbados. When they went to St. Vincent, I took an interest. So I didn't take the same kind of interest, but I was interested in seeing what was happening, what was going on after I was living there. As a member of parliament and as a member of cabinet, you were invited to the Independence Conference in London. If you could recall what happened during that time. There were some problems that arose because Mr. Barrow wanted to independence of Barbados, and there were others who were not so inclined. And uh, among those not so inclined were two cabinet ministers. And after a warm reception, those two cabinet ministers got at a, at a um, political meeting of the Democratic Labour Party, annual general meeting of the Democratic Labour Party. The following day, they told those resigned. And Mr. Barrow invited me the next couple of days later to join him to, at a meeting in St. John, political meeting in St. John. He wanted to have some words with me, so he, I did that. And there he told me what he wanted, and he offered me the position of um, Minister of Thought Portfolio, which is a position that Erskine Ward had. Those two cabinet ministers were. Erskine Ward and Winter Crawford. He explained the circumstances that led to him becoming a senator. Winter Crawford was, a part, was in the House of Assembly. So therefore, and he, there, that was no resignation from the House of Assembly. There was resignation by Ward from the, ministry, from the Senate. If he, didn't, if he didn't resign, well, Mr. Barrow could have fired him from the Senate. But he resigned. Okay? He couldn't fire, he couldn't fire. Um, Mr. Crawford from the House of Assembly. But he, he resigned, there was no problem there, no difficulty. And uh, so I accepted the position as 
Minister of Law Portfolio and leader of the Senate. In those days, Jamaica and Trinidad had already attained independence, so the time was right for Barbados to follow suit. But what were the views of Barbadians about attaining independence? Mixed. Mixed. Um, meetings were held all over the place. We all got good, good crowds. We all got good crowds. I would say that the majority of Barbadians, at that time the bar, bar was very, were quite popular, and the majority of Barbadians ac accepted that we should go along that route, which I'm sure those who opposed it then would say was probably the best thing that happened to Barbados at that time. He sees all you do, and he hears all you say. My lords are writing all the time. He sees all you do, and he hears all you say. My lords are writing all the time. At the time of Barbados' independence, Sir Philip Graves was appointed Minister Without Portfolio. And in 1971, he was given the Ministry of Home Affairs with responsibility for national insurance and housing. As a cabinet minister, he was able to contribute significantly to providing affordable housing solutions for Barbadians at every level. After independence, the elections were early November. Independence was 30th, well, 30th of November. Elections were a couple of weeks before that. So we had to choose ministers all over again under the constitution of Barbados. I was, again, chosen as the, as the Minister of Thought Portfolio, but given certain responsibilities like for urban development, which is a middle-income housing development, it's in uh, one state area, and so on. And uh, also for town planning, um, Home no, sorry, I was made Home Affairs Minister. I was wrong. At that point, I was made Minister of Home Affairs, which meant they had the police, they had immigration, they had, yes, they had urban development, had town planning, and so on. Foremost in his mind was that Barbadians achieved a higher standard of living. After that, I was Minister of Housing, Lands, Labor, and National Insurance. In, from 1971. And what gave me probably the greatest pleasure, I believe, in my, not apart from independence, but this was my doing now, um, was to be made by the ministry that I just got. And they worked hard on the housing because they felt that the housing was so important to the Barbadians that they really need better housing. If a nation's people are to progress, then their social development must be a priority for government. Sir Philip had a vision for the people of Barbados and was on the pulse of their needs. He reflected on those times. I am proud that I was able to develop Eden Lodge for starters. Matter of fact, I can even go back a little bit. At the time, housing consisted of the housing authority, which was low-income housing, the Urban Development Corporation, which was middle-income housing. There was no in-between. In between there, the person, those persons in between, each one would qualify depending on their earnings. And there was no nothing in between there for an individual who does not qualify for middle income housing and was disqualified for, from the from housing authority, the low income. So I decided to bring them together as one, as the National Housing Corporation. I decided to do that, bring them together as one, okay? And so that we could deal with, and, and abolish this, this uh, not quite abolish it, but deal with it in a way in which we could include everybody in, the, in, in, in housing. Sir Philip also worked with private entrepreneurs to provide persons with access to innovative solutions, including solar energy. During his years as a member of cabinet, he was also Minister of Transportation. The life of an MP is never easy. 
He was an avid debater in the House of Assembly. They have come here and they have become law, as the Honorable Thomas has said. Uh, I am going to read out the proposals, sir, that were laid here, and I would like to know how these have been reversed. First, sir. As an MP working for the people, you see? Yeah. Um, I mean, going around the parish and going around. Oh, I did that every week, huh? Every Sunday, as a matter of fact. Every Sunday, I would, what I would do, I would visit an area and work on that area for about two hours or so. The next hour then we spent driving through the rest, of, just driving through the rest of the constituency. People might stop me, have work with them, or they might stop and have work with them, but not work in them. The next Sunday I work in another area and do a similar thing. So I was through the whole area every Sunday, but working a particular one on those sections on a house-to-house -house basis. By today's standards, he had a rather unconventional way of interacting with constituents. I did not establish an office in the constituency. My office was in my car. I drove around. Everybody saw me. I was I drove around. Okay. So that was it. And his impact on Barbados's political landscape? I always saw Sir Philip Grace as one of the stability factors of the Democratic Labour Party of the uh, firstly the Arabara administration and then subsequently the Erskine Sanford administration. Um, Sir Philip is a, is a gentleman who was part of the government but was not a flamboyant and flashy politician but was clearly reliable. He was a safe man in many ways. Um, it was interesting when Arabara made a statement on the floor of the house when um, there were noises that were coming from elsewhere, slightly more flamboyant quarters of the Democratic Labour Party that as far as he was concerned, after him came uh, uh, Sir Lloyd, and after Sir Lloyd, uh, Sir Frederick, Sir, Sir Philip, sorry, and after Sir Philip, any number could play. And I think that that statement was one which certainly to a lot of us were paying attention. It, it told us exactly how important Sir Philip was, because he was one of those people who would be there, he was stable, but he was not necessarily flamboyant, and I think that that's probably why uh, a number of people didn't realize that he was one of the potential uh, leaders or the potential successes. The political analyst also noted his influence when the DLP was at the crossroads. When we had a crisis in 1994, when it was clear that uh, Sir Lloyd had lost a vote of no confidence, um, it appeared as though Sir Philip would take the reins. And it was interesting that the public reaction was one that would not have objected to a situation where he would have taken over even if it wasn't a general election and normally one expects that when there's a change of leader a general election follows. Um, Sir Philip was proposed as an alternative, there was an article in one of the newspapers and I think that there was a sense of national relief that he would have been the safe person to take over. Uh, as it worked out it never happened but certainly for the, the few days that it seemed possible I think that public reaction or public sentiment was there with him for his extraordinary and outstanding achievement and meritorious service to Barbados and to humanity, Sir Philip was conferred with the accolade Knight of St. Andrew, Barbados' highest honor in 2009. On occasions, he acts as Governor General and paid a visit to centenarian Inez Miller. And how is life for you now? What keeps you motivated? What keeps you happy? I live a life that is really modest. Um, I'm very careful about what I eat because I want to live as long as my father. He made it to the hundred and died to 101 years at his death. I want to go beyond that. And that was just a brief look at the outstanding career of former Deputy Prime Minister and Member of Parliament for St. Michael North, Sir Philip Marlowe Grace, as we come to the end of another edition of We Bajans, on location at his ancestral home here in Northumberland, St. Lucie. Thanks for watching. I'm Kathy Lashley. <laughs>